Welcome to Let's Face the Facts, the rewatch podcast for the classic sitcom, The Facts of Life. Join us each week as we synopsize, analyze, criticize, and ultimately idolize the show. And now, here's your host of Let's Face the Facts, the wonderful David Almeida! Thank you, Matthew Arter. Welcome back. It's another week, another show. Thank you for downloading and pressing play. So, this week we're taking a short, unplanned hiatus from season eight because Matthew and I just have a lot going on right now. It's kind of a little unexpected, but I won't go into all the details, but we're just very, very busy right now. I'm actually recording this intro on my phone from a a covert location behind the scenes of a major theme park, which shall not be named. But (laughs) God forbid you don't have our dulcet voices in your ears each week, so we thought we'd give you another peek at an episode of TV Talkaholics. This is the additional podcast that Matthew and I do every month where we discuss some sort of TV show or movie that is facts of life adjacent. We've been doing it for a couple years now, and uh, our Patreon supporters, whom we affectionately call our 2D Fruities, get exclusive first access to this show. Eventually, it'll be widespread released someday. I just, I have no idea when. I have, I haven't made plans yet, but uh, last November, you'll recall, we released an episode where we discussed the TV movie High School USA. That was episode 135. Gave you a little taste, and uh, now we're going to do it again. So there. If you like what you hear, you can have access to the entire TV Talkaholics library, as well as future episodes at the $3 a month level. Your sponsorship also gets you a shout out on the show. Speaking of which, I have a new Tutti Fruity to shout out. Welcome, Daniel C. What's up, Daniel? Thank you so much. Daniel, thanks for the support. You now have access to all of the aforementioned, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the family. So, now, on to this week. Let's journey back to June of 2020. Matthew and I got together with Paul Padilla to discuss Charlotte Ray's memoir, The Facts of My Life. Please forgive the sound quality. It was uh, in the early days of the Zoom calls and the Zoom recordings. Uh, We've ironed out a lot of the kinks since then, so hopefully it will not affect your enjoyment of this lively discussion. And I say let's get to it, huh? Here we go. Enjoy TV Talkaholics Episode 7 Charlotte Ray's The Facts of My Life. Oh, so. Uh, no. More about gel coat. When the fourth. Don't you call in the. More importantly, he knew what he was talking about. My name is David, and I am a talkaholic. Hi, Hi David. David. Whoa, well, my name is Matthew, and I am a talkaholic. Hi. Hi, Matthew. Hi, Ma- Matthew. Okay. Wow. We'll we'll keep working on that. We'll, we'll, okay. Anyhow, welcome to the show. It's another month. It's another uh, 30 days that we've been sequestered from all of society. Uh, this is still the, the quarantine times during the wonderful COVID-19 pandemic that we are living through and permeates all of the art that is produced at the moment. But, wow, uh, we are starting at the bottom, aren't we? We can only go up from here, aren't we? <laughs> we're we're talkaholic. Hi, we mess up the opening, and it's like, welcome to hell. <laughs> this is Jesus. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Matthew and David show. Yeah, I like to call it. There we go. Well, whatever you want to call us, and people have called us many, many things over the years, this is another installment of TV Talkaholics, and um, I think, Matthew, it might qualify as a very special episode, wouldn't you say? Really? We, we have well, what, what makes it so special? We, we have a guest with us. We invited someone. Oh, my God, who? He's, he's on your screen on the Zoom. you got to look on the screen. Oh, I was only looking at me. <laughs> you can Ladies see other people on this? 
We do have a special guest with us today, joining us all the way from the wonderful state of Texas. It is Mr. Paul Padilla, ladies and gentlemen. Ah, I'm honored to be here. Am I your first guest ever, or is this like... This is the first time we, Matthew and I, have had a guest. Oh, sweet. Talkaholics. What's that, believable? Awesome, I am... Yes, I am honored. If that was believable, David has oft told people they were the first. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's been so long right now, I have technically... (laughs) My virginity has grown back. Bro, did hell, you had a stamp made. (laughs) I wish, God. uh, You have no idea how much I wish that were true. So, welcome, Paul. Good to have you. Hey, thanks. I'm really happy to be here. I'm so honored. You are in the Texas. I am in beautiful East Orlando, and Matthew is in beautiful. Where are you, Matthew? I am in beautiful um, Lake Buena Vista. Mm-hmm. Lovely. But our distance uh, physically cannot prevent us from providing you with a powerhouse of entertainment of another monthly installment of the show. And we're actually going to do something we've been talking about for quite some time. We are going to be discussing. Charlotte Ray's book, her autobiography, her memoir, The Facts of My my Life. So Paul and I had discussed this way back when that we were going to be listening to the wonderful audio book of Charlotte Ray's memoir, The Facts of My Life. We thought it'd be fun to do a TV talkaholics like a book club meeting. So here we are. We have all, we've all read up. We've, we've read the book. Matthew, you're Yeah. Yeah. Where was your favorite part, Matthew? (laughs) Oh, my God. um, I really liked um, the beginning. (laughs) And um, there was a bunch of stuff in the middle that I liked, too. Uh But then, you know, the ending really brought it to a close, I thought. It was really good. Wrap that shit up, yeah. That was a a really big twist at the end. Did, Did you get a chance to read or listen to the... Yeah. Completely. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm on board. Woo woo. Let's take okay. this train. So where Come do you want to start? What, do you wanna, what about the yeah. book? What surprised you? What was interesting to you about the book? Well, I know what my favorite thing was. <laughs> I, I'm interested to know what your favorite thing was. My favorite thing. Yeah, because um, I already know my favorite thing. Uh, okay. Well, uh, let's let's just start with just some random, throw out some random littler factoids. Let's not go into any of the long stories. First things first was that uh, Charlotte Ray's, she had two sons, and her older son was uh, severely mentally challenged. Was his name Andy? Was that his name? Andy. It Andy, is, yes. Mm-hmm. yes. Um, so she had put, this is, I'm reading a quote here. Autism was still a big mystery to everyone, including people who were supposed to be experts. Andy never really fit any autism diagnosis available at the time. He showed signs of autism, and he was clearly cognitively impaired, as well as epileptic and schizophrenic, including auditory hallucinations. Uh, So she said his condition, he was um, a dual diagnosis, I think is the term they use for that. So uh, he was, I think, to put it mildly, a handful. So it, it surprised me how much of her life and of the book is her talking about their struggles with raising Andy, with finding care for Andy, with finding doctors or specialists who could work with him to try and improve, and how she worried so much. Uh, you, 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 you think of her when you see her in these series like car 54 where are you and all these things as being you know fun and zany and all in the family and just the funny comedian that she was uh and then you think of then you have to go home and stress about your child and you have to stress about you know all that kind of stuff and it's amazing you see what actors can do you never know what's going on in people's lives i always say that about people that you work with in a show you know yeah. i mean on oh, a daily yeah. day, daily life you never know what people are thinking about so um, yeah yeah, that was one thing that I was always amazed that she was able to deliver at work and then go home and raise yeah, her children. Yeah. And deal with that. And there was a time he was in, for lack of a better term, an institution, what was I think called a mental hospital of the time. But it was 
you know, she was heavily involved. It wasn't like they locked him up and threw away. No, they were. it was he- he- heavily involved. Mm. And I, I remember one of the things that she said when they first finally found a doctor to really like an- analyze and, you know, uh, look at her son. Uh, she said she was so relieved because he told her that he, he really believed that he was autistic and she heard artistic. Art- and like- she was, and, and she was so relieved. She was like, Oh good. I'm so glad he's just artistic. Like we're yes. just, art- he's just artistic. And the doctor was like, no, 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 <laughs> no it's I- called autism. And, but she said they, they didn't know what that was back then. They just, they had no idea what they were dealing with. So, yeah. Um, yeah, but she at first she was so relieved that he was just artistic. Yeah, that was. <laughs> he said, "Your son is autistic," and she was like, "Oh, thank God!" And it's like, um, um, don't yeah. think you heard me, honey. <laughs> so, yeah, Matthew, what did you think about that? The whole um, thing about her and her son. Well, I thought a lot about it. Hmm. You, you had a lot of thoughts and feelings, sir. Yeah, a lot. Of it. I thought. I like closed the book for a minute and thought about it. Okay. So you actually read the book that you had the physical book to open and close? Yep. Yeah. Autographed. She was a dear friend. Well, um, wait oh, a minute. Man, I, I wish I had one of those. No, but first thing that I thought was you, you don't know what she had just dealt with when they said action. Yeah. You know, it's amazing that she could do what she did. Yeah. Like, you know, there's there's no sign of any angst in her. Oh, no. And the book, you know, I mean, of course, obviously, you know, that was beautifully exemplified in that first opening passage that starts the book. You know, the one, Matthew, one? Yep. <laughs> the, the, the one where she actually starts it with her walking down the hallway. Of, down the hallway. That's what I said. Of yep. the institution and saying that she had just gotten a frantic phone call because Andy had he was having a fit or you know an episode or something and he had been breaking things and throwing stuff around and and she was like I think she I think this was the early 70s I think it was when she was on Sesame Street so she's like I gotta go back and be the fucking male lady on Sesame Street and that is the perfect thing about that was and she starts the book with that which I think is fascinating that it's where it's like the first thing out the gate is there was shit going on people and I was dealing yeah. with it. Um, though surprisingly, she doesn't wallow in it. And I will say, you, you know, Paul, you can, can confirm this. She spoke of nothing but affection for Andy. You could tell she loved him. Oh yeah. Every breath of her body and soul when she mentioned having a chubby little baby at home. And even as he got older, when she was talking about, oh, he loved eating and having steak and lobster. And she, but she even went in to talk about, you know, the things that you have to deal with um, as a mom of a uh, teenage boy. Thing. Like he it talked yeah. about, you know, masturbation and how she had to kind of deal with that situation with someone who doesn't know that you're not, you know what I mean? I mean, I'm just saying, Matthew, relax. <laughs> but, you know, and, and then, you know, and having, having to deal with, uh, with girls and he had a little girlfriend and then they'd have to, she, I think she came over one time to visit for the weekend. And- uh, she does talk about at one of the, it was like a, a camp or a, one of the schools Andy went to was in the basement of a church started up by a, uh, a pastor who had a special needs son himself. And she talks about how he ended up befriending this young girl. I think her name was Rhonda. And they clearly liked each other. And so she was like, uh, he's clearly getting to be that age. And I think they'd like to spend more time together. So she called the girl's mother. Mm-hmm. And they had a conversation and she was trying to, and she said, do you think Rhonda would like to come here for Thanksgiving? You guys can come over and all that. And so she said, I was trying to broach the subject of sex, of, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we, <laughs> we need to think about how far do they want. Matthew is making lewd and lascivious gestures right now. <laughs> But what ends up... Um, We've all been in quarantine a very long time, people. <laughs> so, good. So, so, Matthew, here's the fun anecdote, which I'm sure you remember reading yourself. 
but here's the thing. She really grew to like and be friendly with this girl's mother. And she was such a dear, sweet, warm, compassionate woman. Her name was Edna. And yes. when Charlotte Ray was cast in the role of Mrs. Garrett on different strokes, it was one of the directors, I think, who said, okay, well, what are we going to call the maid, uh, the housekeeper? He's like, I had a housekeeper growing up and her name was Mrs. Garrett. So she's Mrs. Garrett. Mrs. Garrett never had a first name until they were developing the character for the spinoff. Mm -hmm. And she, when was, she was working with them, she said, I want her to be named Edna. I want her first name to be that. And she never told them why. But then she later told the woman, she's like, guess what? I named her after you. And the woman was like very, very touched by that. But and I love the story. I mean, I know, I'm sure you've talked about it before, but I love the story how she did the all in the family thing with, which I've never seen. I need to see. I mean, I've seen all oh, the family, but, you know, but, 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 but I don't remember the Tupperware episode that she talks about all the time. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, Norman Lear was doing different strokes. And then she was like, I can't get out of the CBS contract. And he was like, oh, I'll bet you a nickel. She always says that in every interview. I'll yeah. bet you a nickel. I can get you out of that. They owe me a couple of favors because they had like, Sanford and Son and stuff, all this other stuff yeah. that he had worked on. And uh, and so, yeah, he got her out of her CBS contract to do Mrs. Garrett. And I always thought that was cool that, you know, he yeah. stepped up for her and he was like, don't worry about it. I got it. You know? Yeah, she did The Good Times and she did All in the Family. And those were the two things that put her on his radar. And those were good shows, y'all. Those were good shows. Were good I remember shows. even as, no. as a kid, I remember thinking these are good shows. As an did adult, you, I go, yeah. yeah, these are, yeah. Matthew, did you ever see the show, The, the All in the Family with Charlotte Ray, the Tupperware Party? I'm sure I have. I'm just thinking like how fascinated I was when I was reading that story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I, bet you have a, I bet you have a paper cut, don't you, Matthew, from that page? Yeah. It was yeah. so good. Um, but I remember thinking like, I wonder what that phone call was like. Like, did Norman Lear just pick up the fucking phone and you like, boop, 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 boop. Or, well, no, no. He'd be, he, he would have done this. He would have done this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah. then whoever picks up the phone here, this is Norman Lear. I want to talk to Bill Butlicker. And <laughs> head of programming or head of contracts, he's like, hey, I need you to let Charlotte Ray out of her contract. And they're like, yes, Mr. Lear. Whatever you say, Mr. Lear. You yeah. know, like, what, what the fuck did that? Or was he like, I'll give you this? Or did he have to wheel and deal? Or was he just fucking Norman Lear? He because they said at the yes. time, they said that at the time that she was wanting to go to different strokes, that CBS was kind of developing for her a sitcom where she would be a female sheriff, like in a Western, like she's the sheriff 30 yeah. years before. Remember she's the sheriff? Yeah. With yeah. Suzanne Summers. Yeah. He but it was like, where um, she was going to be a sheriff and she was like, oh, it sounds horrible. But luckily she died. Yeah. And what had happened was they had her under contract because of the uh, Beans of Boston, which was the American, are you being served? They had her tied up in that contract where it's like, okay, if this doesn't get picked up, we want to use you for other stuff. And they said she could do spots in other places, but she couldn't take a whole series. And that was what the snag was when uh, Different Strokes came a calling. But uh, Norman Lear, uh, Matthew, I, I think that's what the phone call was. At CBS, CBS, I mean, he literally ruled that network. They had all mm -hmm. the top 10 shows as we've gone over many times and CBS was dominating the ratings because of his stuff. So pretty much he just called someone and said, Hey, uh, you know, that Charlotte Ray, you've got her under contract. I really want to use her for something else. So can you let her out? I'll bet yeah. you that's all it was really. And that, that fascinates you, that kind of power. One thing that last night when I was trying to refresh my memory, I started watching some YouTube videos of just her being interviewed. She had mentioned that in that Tupperware episode uh, that Carol O'Connor was not there because he was uh, he wasn't in the episode because he was holding out for more money in his mm -hmm. negotiation. So she didn't even work with him, but she had a great time working yeah. with uh, Gene Stapleton. Yeah. Yes. And so that's, that's the thing. I believe I, I was asking Matthew if he had seen it. I believe at the end of that episode is when uh, Edith gets the phone call saying Archie is missing like where you thought he was, he wasn't. And that other place where you thought he was instead, he's not yeah. there. Like, we don't know where he is. And that oh. was the show trying to see if they could do Home in the Family without Archie. <laughs> <laughs> no. You can't. Because they did the Archie Bunker's place and Archie's place and all that afterwards. Yeah. Like, you know, was, can we do yeah. Valerie without Valerie Harper? <laughs> oh, oh, wait, they can. <laughs> <laughs> For like three years or something. Yes. Yeah. Can I say 
since you brought up the fact that they named that character Edna, I found it interesting that um, they ended up with a character named Andy Mm -hmm. on the show. Yes. And I have to wonder if she had something to say about that. Like, because he was kind of a son figure to her, kind of became like a a son figure. And I think if she had stayed, it would have been her instead of Beverly Ann that adopted him, I think. Don't you? I feel like that's where they were probably aiming. But, um... I don't think they, I don't think she specifically mentions because the Andy years were really not, there wasn't that much of an overlap. There's also Beverly Ann, Mrs. Garrett's sister, is named for Charlotte Ray's older sister, Beverly. And that's, that's what else I put, that she had a sister named Beverly. Yeah. And, and Beverly, who was a bitch, according to Charlotte. Well, you remember that part, Matthew? Yeah. <laughs> Charlotte was the middle child of three daughters. And so the young one was like a little, was like the pretty princess baby. And Beverly Ann, she always talked about being kind of her older, hypercritical sister who had also gone to Northwestern and studied performance and was supposed to become Mm -hmm. a singer, but then didn't have, she thinks she didn't have the courage or the guts to actually go for it. So she went back to Milwaukee, got married and started a family and strongly encouraged Charlotte to do it too. Like Charlotte Ray was even kind of like, really? She couldn't fulfill her dream and she was trying to take mine away also. And it's like, ooh. Over the years, they did reconcile a bit. They had a nice time when they all went to Paris or the Facts of Life goes to Paris. But uh, what other family stuff did you guys pick up on about her family and her growing up and her rearings? Her, about her formative years. Take it, Matthew. Um, I always love the story of like, you know, dad was a tire salesman and, you know, and like, I am also fascinated with how she changed her name, Mm -hmm. you know, um, like somebody at a radio just told her that that last name ain't going to work. Yeah. If you know what I mean. (laughs) That was so common in those days. Like what was, um. What was Tony Curtis's name when B. Arthur talks about it? It was like oh. Ben Schwartz or something. Bernie Schwartz. Bernie. <laughs> hey there, my name is Bernie Schwartz. I'm a movie star. Well, her real name is um, Bernice Frankel. Bernice Frankel. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But simply put, Charlotte... Charlotte Lubotsky, they were like, no, that's not good. Do you have a middle name? She's like, Ray. He goes, there, there it is. You're Charlotte Ray. All of a sudden, you're a wasp. Yeah, exactly. Can, can we pause one second? Matthew, are you yeah. in the bathroom? What? Are you in the bathroom? I am. Are, are you sitting on the toilet right now? I am. <laughs> What's wrong with you? Oh, no, I'm not pooping. Oh, my God, David. <laughs> you're sitting on the toilet. Yeah. Ew, David! <laughs> yeah, I am changing my insulin pump thing, and it happens to be on my leg, David. I'm, I'm sorry, I thought you were... The doing... very idea, David! <laughs> that I would go through all of this setup to make you think that I was taking a dump. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I doubted your, your judgment and your taste level. Thank you. Now, Paul, will you continue with what you were saying there? God, I'm exhausted. Okay. No, I was watching a YouTube video. Because that... I like to keep it classy, <laughs> David. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Matthew. So let's move on to uh, another just interesting tidbits that were revealed in this book. The show, The Facts of Life, taped on Tuesday nights. And the really? way the week cycle ran was... Wednesdays were the table read of the upcoming episode, so the week-long cycle. Wednesday was the table read of the new show. Thursday would be script changes. Friday would be trying the new scenes. She said Monday uh, and Tuesday were the grueling days, Monday in particular, because Monday was the camera blocking day and Mm -hmm. uh, all that. So that was camera day. So Monday and Tuesday were the long ones. But they would do three shows in three weeks and then have a week off. So they would only put out three shows a month. And that was 
because they started early enough in the season they could keep up with that but yeah uh, and that was important to her i mean she liked that for her family and for her normalcy of her life and probably was pretty good for the kids too to be able to have some time exactly you know because away. like she said having a disabled son and that's the other thing is that in the the days leading up to different strokes and the facts of life basically leading up to uh the california years before she moved out west she talks about how she turned down so much work because she wanted to be available for her family and she wanted to help out. And thankfully, her husband was a very successful music, what was the term she used? A music producer, music editor. Mm -hmm. He didn't compose per se. That wasn't his main thing, but he did do that. That was, uh, of course, the wonderful everybody knows as John Strauss. Let's let's talk about him a little bit, Matthew. Were you surprised about what, what happened and came to pass with the husband? Oh my gosh. I could not believe it. Were you as shocked as she was to be nudged awake in the middle of the night? Probably more so. I mean, well, I mean, I've been nudged awake in the middle of the night, but usually it's met with, you got to get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> But we're talking to have your husband of 25 years tell you that now that he is sober and going to AA, which he gave her shit for when she got sober, because he's still- Which we, we, we haven't talked about, which we need to talk about, but yeah. We got to talk yeah. about the sobriety thing too, but anyhow, yeah. now he had just completed his fourth step. For those who don't know, the fourth step of the 12-step program is taking a ruthless moral inventory of yourself and of your faults with preparation for uh, going through people you have wronged. And then I think the fifth step is the actual making amends. But when he told his sponsor, um, I think I'm bisexual. I had a relationship, a brief fling with a boy when I was a teenager. And I went to my parents and asked them to get me with a psychiatrist to fix me. And they did. And I don't think it quite worked because in recent years I've been stepping out very rarely on my wife with other men. So the sponsor said, you need to tell your wife now. And it was like middle of the night, she was asleep and she was woken up with him saying, hey, um, honey, so <laughs> funny thing. And then he told her everything. And then typical man, he rolled over and went to sleep. She actually says that in the story. Because the burden of finally saying this and un, un, for, forgive the expression, unloading on her, uh, it was like such a relief. He rolled over and went to sleep, and she's like, "I got up. I was like, I can't fucking sleep." And she ended up calling a friend and waking up this friend and going over to the friend's house, and and that eventually uh, they divorced, but they still stayed on very good terms. And thankfully, because Char, even though she was a girl raised in Milwaukee by uh, you know, pretty strict Jewish parents. She was very open-minded, thankfully, and didn't look up on homosexuality as being this awful thing. And I got to keep my kids away from you and shit. Yeah, she there was, was a show business. There was a great interview with her, uh, like I said on YouTube last night, watching where she was like in her maybe her last six months being alive. She was talking to a drag queen at an actress fund benefit that she was getting uh, honored at, and. She was holding his hand and kissing him and having a great time. And it just, they were just having such a good time. And I remember thinking, that's, that's great. Yeah. So that's the thing with the husband. And then we almost, we had another side by there about, about her sobriety and about her drinking. Matthew, do you yeah. want, to, do you want to, to take this and talk a bit about See, see here's the whole thing. It was the 50s. Everybody drank mm -hmm. martinis, not just like a glass of wine. It was like, let's have some martinis. The reason it was called a Harvey Wall banger, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Especially in Hollywood. And let's just say it was Cary Grant's favorite drink. Oh, uh, the Harvey <laughs> Wall banger? <sighs> he would bang anything, including the wall. <laughs> so it's like, I would imagine, and I was thinking, like, how much of a fucking drunk do you have to be to admit you have a problem? in that time period. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Well, yeah. it was, it just wasn't a thing. You got, you came home, you drank till you went to bed and then you got up and went to work, came home, drank till you went to bed. Yeah. And it's just, that's how life was. I feel like maybe I have a, 
a different idea of how the 50s were, but you see those advertisements in Life magazine, they're basically selling alcohol to women and, and pills to women. Like, help calm your mood during the day. Yeah, have some downers. But, but I mean, pregnant pre- pregnant women had martinis and smoked cigarettes. Oh, <laughs> I mean, yeah. It was a fine thing to do. So like, it wasn't even a I want to know, because of that, I want to know how, I want to be a fly on the wall on one of Charlotte Ray's drunken nights. Oh. <laughs> like, it's where she said, bull feathers. Yeah, exactly. Like, I want to be there. I want to see what, forced her at that time period to be like, I need, I need to talk to someone. Yeah. Well, it was early in the early seventies. I feel like it was maybe around 71 or 72 when she was, it was when she was working Sesame street and it was actually uh, a rap party for Sesame street that she called and found out where the nearest meeting was to go to her first AA meeting. And, and she does say, I wondered if I should include this in the book because it's supposed to be at Alcoholics Anonymous. But she was like, eh, at my age, I'm thinking it's more important to let people know I've gone through this and I've, you know, I'm in sobriety, I'm in 12-step program. And if it might help somebody, then she's like, it's worth it. But it was, um, yeah, when you think of the early, like being in the 50s, like coming up in the 50s, being in that crowd in New York, Oh, yeah. And then in the 60s, once the 70s hit, somebody once said the 70s were the hangover from the 60s. Yeah, totally was. Totally was. So the party's over. That sense of, yeah, I imagine in the early 70s at that point, getting completely dog-ass, pass-out drunk every day. Partially because she and her husband drank together. They were drinking buddies. And it put a strain on yeah. her and she quit. And the other thing is that it was her escape and having a special needs child. I mean, that was yeah. literally something you, you could not escape from. And there was just no support or structure to help people with. And that's what they would do with their evening, she said. She would just they'd come home, they'd get a couple of models, and they just tear it up, finish those mm-hmm. bottles. I mean, that's, that's what they did, you know? Yep. Um, so, uh, Matthew, is there anything? I read the book, David. I, I know <laughs> <laughs> What's the book called again, Matthew? What's the book called again? Uh, oh. Called, <laughs> called Charlotte Ray. <laughs> Ray of Sunshine? Ray of Lights. Says, Hi, my name is Charlotte. Are you there, God? It's me, Charlotte. It was Charlotte's Web. Charlotte's Charlotte. Web. Web of Charlotte's. Did you read Charlotte's Web? <laughs> That's what I thought we were talking about. Oh, okay. Oh. And I was nervous because I didn't read the book. I watched the movie. So I was all ready with my Agnes Moorhead impersonation, <laughs> my Paul Lind, uh, my <laughs> Debbie Reynolds. Father time <laughs> mother <laughs> and father time. Oh, oh my that God. Was, Somebody like, give Debbie a Xanax. <laughs> It's like Debbie Reynolds just hopped onto our Zoom call. That's amazing. <laughs> it says crunchy. <laughs> well, perfect, perfect segue. Paul Lind, Matthew, even though you may not have read this book, Paul Lind, as we have stated many, many times, he went to Northwestern with Charlotte Ray. And, and didn't uh, Cloris Leachman go as well? Yeah. Cloris Leachman did too. Yeah. Now, Cloris yeah. Leachman left after her sophomore year, as yeah. did their classmate and peer, Patricia Neal. So the two of them did two years and then were like, fuck this, we're getting work, we're going to New York, yeah. we're going to do yeah. this. Shit. And they did. Oh, Paul Lind. Paul Lind. They were friends. They were friends. They were very did good friends. Did she talk at all about her theater career? Did she talk about what it was like to be, because she did Three Penny Opera with B. Arthur. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she doesn't talk a lot about B. Arthur. It's like a, it's, I think it's because it's a small blip because she didn't do it for that long. It was a short run because she left it very early. Uh, because when um, she was already committed to starting to rehearse the pajama game for Broadway for George Abbott. And that was opening two weeks after Three Penny. So it was like she was going to have to be rehearsing one while performing the other. And her nightclub act was happening later. Yeah. She was exhausted. And uh, I, I think she wasn't really quite conscious, Matthew, for the whole experience. And then 
the big uh, <laughs> and drunk, probably, yes. And then the other thing is that when she did get to, she says the run through, I'm assuming she means like a dress run through. The run through of pajama game, she had her script in her hand because she couldn't memorize her lines. And she was so embarrassed. And she says to this day, I can't believe I was that unprofessional, but I was just at the end of my rope. And then at the end of the rehearsal, they came to her and said, we decided to combine your role with Carol Haney's role. And of course, this show was a huge Carol Haney uh, triumph, and that's what made her famous. And so they said, you're welcome to stay in like a tiny role in the chorus and not have a song and just be basically a little nobody peon. And she was, she was angry at the time. She was mad at herself, but she was also mad because it, it, theoretically it wasn't, well, it's because you're unprofessional, we're firing you. It was, we're making changes to the script and you're out now. And that really upset her. But uh, yeah, so I think the anecdotes about Three Penny, she just kind of glosses over the fact that B. Arthur and John Aston and other folks were actually in that production. And, you know, the things that you, that you remember whenever you, if you, the shows that she did, you think of Three Penny Opera, you think of, you know, that kind of stuff. But the, but the ones that she was nominated for, I really had never heard of. It's like Pickwick is one, and then Here and Now, or something like that. Uh, but I had never heard of, you know, of those shows. But she was nominated for Tony's for those two. Yeah. How did she talk about Little Abner? Did she manage to she? I think it went on too long for her, I think. Didn't it? Yeah, she didn't want to yeah. do it. It was one of those things yeah. where she didn't want to be away from the home and the family. And back in those days, when you signed on for a Broadway show, you were touring up and down the coast doing your out-of-town tryout. So right. they're taking her away from the family. So she, um, and I don't know if she had the other kid at this point, which is her son, Larry, with whom she wrote the book, uh, Larry Strauss. Um, but she talks about, she asked for too much money. She's like, I don't want to do Lil Abner. Thank you for offering. So she said, oh, tell them I'll do it for seven fifty a week. And the agent, I mean, that's a lot of money now, not in 50, 1956. I mean, fuck. So she said, tell them I'll do it for seven fifty a week. She says her agent had to say, like, did, what did you just say, seven fifty? And she said, and unfortunately, they said yes. They, they offered and agreed and met her rate. So... Um, she had to do it, but she, her big thing was, here's the funny thing. She said, I didn't want to do this cartoon comic strip, broad comedy musical. She's like, I was a serious actress. I wanted to be doing Shakespeare and Shaw and Ionesco. Do you know how much money that is in today's, like if somebody had gone to a Broadway show that you were not the star of? Yeah. What is, what is the equivalent number of dollars today? $7,191. A week. Yeah, that was a lot of money. But she does talk about how two people that were her buddies in that production were Edie Adams and Tina Louise. And, uh, Tina, Tina Louise? Tina Louise was in it. And wow. uh, she said Stubby K made a pass at her. And um, she said Julie Newmar, I think, was making more than she was <laughs> because she was... I think she said Julie Newmar, they always joke, was the best paid because she was making the most per minute because Julie Newmar was barely in it. She like has oh. a walk yeah. across the stage and just a fucking gorgeous moment. And Bern Hoffman, she said it was a jerk. She hated working with him. Yeah, he was kind of a dick. He was a, Did she a give any, anything? Did she give any reasons? He was always teasing her mocking her line readings and ridiculing her and and just picking on her and teasing her yeah it's like what the fuck yeah. dude and she didn't oh. she didn't uh, hold back talking about how she did not like it yeah in, who in would be such a jerk to make fun of charlotte ray's line readings matthew i matthew i'm feeling attacked Girls, girls. <laughs> okay. what do you say i have no idea what you're talking about but uh, yeah, so this guy Byrne was a real jerk for mocking Charlotte Ray. And uh, yeah, fuck that guy. So um, yeah, and uh, when they said good, like when the, either when the run ended or when she left or when he left the production, um, she actually said, 
well, it's been interesting working with you, and I hope I never have to do it again. She said it to his fucking face. Mm -hmm. and she said that, thankfully, she never did. Try to, oh, another thing. Um, so, Matthew, back to your uh, other Broadway stage credit anecdotes. Yeah. She talks about doing a play called The Beauty Part. Had you ever heard of this show called The Beauty Part? It's a play. Mm -hmm. It's not a musical. Right. And um, it's no, but The Beauty Part mm -hmm. was... Um, was the name of one of my nightclub acts in um, when I was in Tijuana, but that was before the donkey died. So <laughs> the main attraction was I could clear a billiard table without using a cue stick. Okay, well, thank you for that for for sharing. Um, but the thing is, the beauty part I couldn't find. My, it doesn't even have a Wikipedia page, but. You do see it like in the Samuel French. It's some sort of a tour de force show for an actor to play multiple crazy roles. And it was written for Bert Lahr. And this was in 1962. This is towards the end of his career. And she said he was, he was difficult. He was always questioning things. He was always uh, being kind of a pain. And uh, they had one scene together. And she noticed he was kind of trying to up, physically upstage her. And she was like, what the hell? The director actually said to her, he's an old man. You only have one scene with him. Let him have the scene. So she said it ended up that she basically had the scene with him with her back to the audience. So he could do what he did. And she said it was fine. She had other moments in the show. And at the end of it, years later, she overheard someone had said to Bert Lahr, oh, I, I hear you work with Charlotte Ray or something. And she, Bert Lahr said, oh yeah, Charlotte Ray, she's a wonderful actress. <laughs> but it's like, yeah. Also in the beauty part on the Broadway, two people with whom she became very close, Larry Hagman. And, and by the way, nothing but, n nothing but overwhelmingly positive things about what a nice, dear, generous man Larry Hagman and his wife uh, were. So uh, his, not, his wife was not a generous man. His wife was a generous, well, you know what I mean, yeah. And the other is, um, I think I fucked up, guys. Alice Ghostly. I thought Alice Ghostly went to Northwestern huh? with them. I don't think she, to hear her talk, I don't think she met Alice Ghostly till 1962 when they did the beauty part. But uh, she said they became her chums and she really enjoyed working with them, but... Why That's a we, lot of stars for a show that nobody's ever heard of. And here's the thing. There was a newspaper strike that hit just when the show opened. So they couldn't get any press out. There was no ability to put out ads and press and get reviews published. So the show ended up closing way too early. But you are not wrong for looking at that and going, wow, that is weird. So at the same time she was doing the beauty part in 1962, this is also when she was doing Car 54, Where Are You? Because that was mm -hmm. filmed in New York City. So she would do those during the day and then do the show at night. Uh, and in fact, her husband, John Strauss, wrote the theme song to Car 54. So she also had that. Car one. 54, Where Are You? Yep. She was on like 11 out of 60 of the episodes. And um, yeah, uh, she almost got to be Matthew. She, it was down to her and the other actress to play Fanny Bryce's mother in the original Funny Girl on the Broadway. Whoever yeah. the other actress was, it was like down between her and Charlotte and uh, Charlotte wanted to do it. And they were trying to negotiate the salary and then Kennedy was shot. So that kind of everything kind of blew up and there was a question of what the show was gonna happen and all that. and. By the time they kind of got back to it, they had already locked in the other one, and so she missed out. But then her response is, oh, well, more time to be home with the family and my boys. Uh, come back, little Sheba. Yeah. That was hers. And uh, that's the one where she tells the story. This is the great example of the Kinahora, the, the evil eye in the Jewish culture where Parents are ever afraid to draw positive attention towards their children for fear that they will be punished or... You have that in the Mexican culture as well, yeah. <laughs> now, My I mom know, get mad at me. Now, now, I've heard the title come back 
Little Sheba, but I'm not familiar. I don't know the player scene. Have you ever seen it? Are you guys familiar? Yeah, but it wasn't a Shirley Booth. Wasn't it big for Shirley Booth as well? Uh, That's what it is. Charlotte Ray yeah. stepped in for Shirley Booth after right. Shirley left the original production. That's what it was. Yeah. And when her mother came to see the show, she said she came afterwards backstage and she said, basically, like she said, like, you were fine. And then proceeded to praise all the other actors complain about where her seat was, complain that the side that she was on was making a crick in her neck bad. And <laughs> it was all oh that my God. God. It wasn't until years later that her older sister, Beverly Ann, said, you know, mom loved seeing you in that. She said, watching it, it was after the first 20 minutes, she forgot it was you. Like you were mm -hmm. that good in it. And that's what mom told And Charlotte Ray's like, well, she never told me that she thought I was that good. But that's... That's the culture. That's yeah. The culture. Um, I didn't realize Charlotte Ray and I have the same mother. Oh, no. <laughs> we've discussed. Oh, bless. Yeah. So let's uh, start to sort of wrap this up and bring it back to the real reason that we're here is the facts of life. And I did transcribe some of the passages here. from Very short chapters, by the way. I wanted a lot more than she put. Matthew, but... I see the judgment in your eyes. It's like you're going to read some psalms or something. <laughs> this, is, this is like scripture, scripture chapter and verse here. Um, but, when it was over, but when it was over, I wanted more. I will say that. But, but it was, I, I was okay. because <laughs> I, I wanted a little bit more. Speaks, she speaks slowly, and it was 11 hours. <laughs> I, <laughs> 1. I, 7 speed. I was, I was like, this is good. No. So I was doing a show an hour away. I was doing a show in Sanford. So I had an hour there every day and an hour back. So I listened yeah. to it in real time, but yeah. No, I, I could and I had to speed it up. I, rec I recommend 1.6 for those <laughs> listening to the Audible book on, uh, on the Audible app. So here's what she wrote. I'm not going to do the voice. By the fifth season of Facts, which is where we are right now, I dreaded going to work. I cried in the summer when it was time to start up another season, but I didn't want to leave the show until I was sure the girls could succeed without me. Maybe they were ready after the fifth or sixth season, but I wasn't sure, and I didn't want to be selfish about it. Meanwhile, we managed always to do some good work. I worked, what, I worked with whatever the writers and producers gave me, always. Tried to get the most out of every moment. I tried to make every line, every beat, every reaction specific and meaningful. You know what they say, there are no small parts. How ironic for the star of the show to be reciting that. I'm glad I stuck around to work with the girls a little longer. It wasn't always easy. And sometimes I found myself feeling like a patient old horse, but it was worth it. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, she made the money, but yeah, she said she was not fulfilled anymore. And, uh, yeah. you know, and was... was but how she's being yeah. marginalized in her own yeah. show. And you can tell in the show, you know, she'd pop in and say a couple of things and pop out, pop in and say a couple of things, pop <laughs> out. Um, yeah, so yeah. And then yeah. and then all of a sudden she'd be call she would go home to visit her sister and she'd be just calling in for one scene on the phone. And uh, yeah. Yeah, it's just, yeah. Because the older sister was back home in Milwaukee and then I think the younger one was married with a family in Texas, I want to say. And so now regarding her when she actually did leave, she says, um, she already had talked about she wanted artistically to do other stuff, which is why she did uh, a PBS movie, um, Words by Heart. She did uh, The Worst Witch in 1986. Which people love. I've never seen it, but people talk about it all the time. I mean, on these, yeah. I've, I've seen most of it, but I'm. Ugh, it was a little rough to get through. I got to try again. Well, but one of the first things she did was uh, the uh, California Company of uh, Into the Woods. Oh, that's right. That was uh, after. She was. She was. Was it after the Worst Witch? <clears throat> yeah, that was. I after it was Facts of Life. Uh, oh no, I'm saying it was right after Facts of Life. Didn't she go do Sondheim Into yeah. the Woods? Yeah, she yeah. did. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to read another passage here. <clears throat> I needed to do other things, other work and travel, and more time to just sit and enjoy life. More time in my beautiful backyard with the orange blossoms and the birds and Andy's wind chimes. But by then I knew the girls could carry the show themselves. I really had become expendable. I don't mean that in a bad way. I was proud of the girls. They had really emerged. We were an ensemble cast now. The network and the producers, however, did not believe in my expendability. 
and I guess they assumed I was holding out for a big payday. And that's what they offered me. And the way she says it, a lot of money to stay. It was tempting. I won't lie about that. My friend, writer Everett Greenbaum, urged me to stay with the show. He said, get every nickel out of it. Mm -hmm. And I understood what he meant. Me, most of us only have one chance to make the big money, but I'd already made enough. For me, it was never about getting rich. I just wanted to be able to keep my house and afford to plant new flowers every spring and get around in a decent car and travel a little and leave something for Andy and for Larry and his family. I had all that and no amount of money was worth the pressure and anxiety of a network series. Not anymore, not at 60 years old with so much left to do in my life. That's awesome. I love that. that was, I love, I I love that. A nice little send off for herself as far as why she Mrs. was- Mrs. Garrett. Yeah. Yeah. So Matthew, what else about, oh, um, uh, what else about the book do, do you wish you might have read about before we wrap this up? Oh, I would like to see, and they are not on YouTube because I have searched, I would like to see bloopers from the facts of life. Oh my God. I totally agree with you. That would be that's one of my something. things. I like to, when I find a sitcom that I like or a show that I like, I will type in um, for bloopers on, um, on YouTube. Yeah, that's right. They are not out there. There's, there's nothing on the DVD set that I, that I can see. The DVD I think set. that's a shame. I agree. It would have been fun to see them like laughing and cracking up and uh, yeah. putting up. Matthew, you know what? It's been fun. I think we've done it again. I think we have created yet another classic. Um, I, I, I think that every single episode of TV Talkaholics is going to go down. It's, you know, it will be like the, the golden girls of podcasts where yeah. each episode is so superlative. That yeah. You can't, uh, yeah determine which is better from the other because they're all just so amazing. Yeah. Uh -huh. But uh, yeah. Well, let's do our little sign off here and uh, the book. We highly recommend it. Listen to it. 1.6 speed. Cannot stress that hard enough. <laughs> uh, listen to it. It's called The Facts of My Life by Charlotte Ray and Larry Strauss, which is her son. And uh, uh, on, on that note, yeah. Uh, we have to say our goodbye and thank you. Well, and if you're not going to read that book and you accidentally just watch the movie of Charlotte's Web, let me highly recommend the original with Debbie Reynolds, not the remake that they did in most recently. It's not as Is good. It, the Dakota Fanning. Yeah. Julia good. Roberts as a CGI creepy ass spider face spider. Yeah. yeah. Not good pretty yeah it's pretty scary so can i tell you just one story real quick that i always liked sure my friend ryan in uh los angeles i went to school with him in new york and he moved to los angeles uh -huh. and in uh the early to early 2000s maybe late 90s uh, uh the story already that he did a show with charlotte ray in uh, los angeles and no. uh she was uh it was like a just a show that he, she did, and the, the picture that he posted upon when she passed away was her in a barrel. She was laughing inside of a barrel, and it's oh. a show that they did together in LA. And uh, he said that he drove her home every day. Oh, her, uh, and she was just so sweet, so young, and he was probably in his probably in his twenties. He was probably twenty four, twenty five at the time. Uh -huh. And, um, but she would drive her home every night after rehearsals. And at the very, very last performance, he drove her home and she gave him a card. And inside the card, she just thanked him for uh, listening to her stories and being her friend for the show and a check for $500 to pay for gas and stuff because she knew that he was a young, struggling actor in LA. And he just thought it was cool. And he posted about it when she died with the uh -huh. pictures of them uh, he dropping her off. So anyway, I thought that was really sweet. So awesome. I thought that was a nice story, something to have, you know. That's delightful. Part of Charlotte. No, she definitely, you can tell yeah. that she is, a, she's one of the good eggs. She's one of the generous people and all that. So, uh, thanks guys for allowing me to be a part of your uh, television aholics. <laughs> T television aholics, sure. We'll go with that. 
Thank you, Paul, uh, so much for being our guest. And uh, thank you for talking about the book. And uh, it's, it's been fun. It's been great seeing your face again. And oh, instead of our normal send off, I'm thinking maybe a better, uh, a better ending finale to the episode. I think we need to hear some more of Debbie Reynolds in Charlotte's Web. <laughs> I think we need to hear some more of Debbie Reynolds and we'll sign off on this. Watch Mother Earth and Father Time. Mother Earth and Father Thank you, Matthew. It was beautiful on that note. <laughs> Thank you. This concludes another TV Talkaholics. Tune in again next month. And thank you all for being our Tutti Fruity Patreon sponsors. We love you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Let's Face the Facts was created, produced, written, hosted, and edited by the wonderful David Almeida. Our theme song was beautifully arranged and recorded by Ned Wilkinson. Please visit facethefactspod.com for supplemental photos and videos, links to social media, and ways that you can support the show. And don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. This is Matthew Arder saying tune in again next week for another thrilling episode of Let's Face the Facts.